So you guys remember the drone video from my little session. Again, the afternoon is much more optimistic, which is why I'm about to get off the stage and hand it over to, um, <laughs> to Rob with the city of Stillwater. Uh, Rob Hill is the emergency management coordinator. I have that right? Director, emergency management director for the city of Stillwater. And in 2014, uh, they implemented their first purchase of uh, UAVs or UASs. And um, I've seen them do a variety of talks on this before. It's honestly a really impressive program. And unlike the ones that we just saw, which were used for terror, they use them to save lives and catch bad guys. So I will stop talking and let Rob start. All right, well, good afternoon. As he said, my name is Rob Hill, and I'm the Emergency Management Director for the City of Stillwater. Uh, just out of curiosity, before we get started, how many people are currently using um, UAS technology in their communities? Okay, three, four? All right, very good. How far advanced are you? How many do you have? Two, one, one? Okay, very good, all right. Well, let's get started. So listen, back in 2013, 2012, 2013, we went to a presentation and some people had some drones on some tables and, and listen, for the, for the context of this talk, I'm gonna refer to them as drones because we all know what they are, right? But when we do a public presentation, we never say the D word, ever. We don't say the D word. D word implies militarized, weaponized, long flying, controlled somewhere else, and can do really bad stuff, right? So what we actually fly is SUAS, right? Unmanned aircraft systems, that's what we fly, that's what we utilize, okay? So, but for the context of this and for the ease, I'll just, I'll just use the word drone. But we saw at this conference <clears throat> so the technology, and it was actually, um, just like this Phantom 3 that's sitting on this table, this little white one, we saw a Phantom 1 DJI brand aircraft, and they had a pilot in there, and he was flying it <clears throat> in free form in the room, and we went, wow, that's cool. Had a camera on it. You could see what he was looking at. Didn't really put too much emphasis on it. Um, kind of a toy more than anything, right? Then we found out that there were a couple of emergency management programs in the state of Oklahoma that were utilizing this technology to be able to help with public safety um, during times of emergencies. And we went, oh yeah, we gotta get one of those. So we started researching, right? And we communicated with those departments. How are you functioning? How are you flying? What does your program look like? Do you have paperwork? Do you have documentation? Do you have guidelines, policies, procedures? How did you buy it? Where'd you get the funding? Um, so we really started grilling and questioning and asking all these types of questions. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we did, we did policies, deployment procedures. Um, we actually went to the state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security and asked if they had any funding. Do you guys have any money that you can funnel to us and believe it or not, we were one of the ones that were actually able under the Emergency Management Performance Grant to receive some dollars, some matching dollars to buy aircraft. Once that happened, it kind of opened the floodgate. I will tell you, they shut it down quick, right? Because everybody started asking for them. Once one does it and everybody finds out, everybody wants it, right? So they shut it down, but we were actually able to get um, some funding support. Um, the biggest thing after we secured that, after we got some ideas of how we would utilize them, um, how we would have policy written, the funding, we had to go to leadership, right? Because leadership was the tough sell. Leadership looked at these as toys. Why are we going to pay you guys to fly these remote control, RC controlled aircraft on the clock, right? What's the benefit? How does that, how is that going to help us? How is that going to advance any of our programs with you guys just playing and flying around all day, right? So um, it took some work. We had to make several presentations. We had to bring it up, you know, in conversation. We had to talk to um, the city leaders kind of one-on-one -on -one and explain what our ultimate goal was. Then we had to put a plan together and, and sell it to them, right? So 
Eventually, we got enough buy-in to purchase um, the first aircraft. Now, the first aircraft was roughly about $2,000, and it looked just about like this one here, except for the fact that it had a GoPro mounted on it, and it did not have um, the camera that came out with the aircraft. Um, we originally purchased three of these, and the idea was we would have two trainers and one that was for operations, and one of the trainers could be a backup if something happened to the operations aircraft, okay? And we purchased these, all of these, with the intent that we were gonna do fire support. Talked to a gentleman right here from, from Hitchcock, Oklahoma a minute ago that he said, man, it would have really been nice had we had, had access to these during the Blaine fires where we couldn't get vehicles, right? And we couldn't get people and couldn't get eyes on. So that was the thing that we um, pitched to use to get um, the uh, permission to buy the aircraft. All right, now with that, let's see. Um, we found out that the very thing that we wanted to use these for in the conditions that we wanted to use it was not compatible. You know, 50 mile an hour ground winds, fire that's spreading, you know, a mile, um, an hour, or, or just, making its own weather, um, the heat, and warping the blades, um, the impact to the aircraft itself by, by being in the smoke and the fans pulling the dirty air into it and everything, wasn't conducive. So the very thing that we wanted these aircraft for, we couldn't use it for. So then we were kind of stumped, standing around scratching our heads, now what are we gonna do, right? Well. Lo and behold, turns out everybody's got good ideas all the time, but, um, but we wanted to be able to deploy those to see the spread of wildfires. We wanted to be able to, to tell crews ground truth information, let them know where's the fire that is not being contained at the moment. Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't. The little aircraft that you see on the table, extreme limitations, right? So the more extreme limitations you got, the bigger you have to go. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we also wanted to support law enforcement, but we were, we were unsure of what that looked like, right? How do you support law enforcement? We didn't know. They didn't know. But we knew that there was an opportunity that we could support their operations, and you're going to see some of that later. We knew we could use the aircraft for damage assessments because we had already seen other emergency management programs around the state do that. And, and they pay dividends. And you're gonna see some of that here in a little bit. Um, we learned that after we got it, after we got the aircraft in, things quickly started to spiral out of control for, for us. We, we got the aircraft, we thought everything was gonna be good. There was no regulations, there was no restrictions. We didn't have to have permission from anybody. We could go, we could launch, we could deploy the aircraft anywhere we wanted, anytime we wanted, in any way we wanted. And then all of a sudden the government got involved. And it's kind of like they knew we bought our aircraft and they went, whoa, slow down. Well, we found out first thing we had to do is we had to register the aircraft. Well, why do we have to register the aircraft? Because they want to know how many is out there. It costs a $5 fee, you got to register every aircraft you got. You only have to do it once, but you have to register your aircraft. And they collect some information from you, right? So they're building a database. Not too long after that, um, we learned that, guess what? We're gonna have to have, we're gonna have to be pilots. We're gonna have to get a license, right? We're gonna have to be part 107 pilots. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means you're gonna have to know airspace. You're gonna have to know how to talk on aircraft frequencies to, to let them know when you're um, not under the control of an air traffic control tower, um, how to communicate with the aircraft in the area and let them know where you are. Um, you're gonna have to know the height restrictions, the distance restrictions, how, you know, how far can you fly? We were, at, we were asked all the time, how far will this thing go? Well, guess, it, you know, in right conditions, we can fly 10, 15 miles from the, from the remote. But legally, we can only fly as far as we can see it. Now, that means wearing regular corrective lenses or the naked eye, not with binoculars, not with anything else. But there are loopholes, right? You can put people out in the field farther away, and as you transition from one person's view 
you can go into another person's view, and as long as they can relay that on the radio to you, you're good. But, but you see, there started to be all these regulations that we didn't have before that we were having to back up and overcome. So we began the process <clears throat> of becoming Part 107 um, pilots, combination of staff and volunteers, um, be, um, started training tests, and we knew that we were gonna have to retest every other year, there was gonna be a fee, because we had to go to a very sterile environment to test, and, and now then they've since opened that up where you can retest online, and it's, and it's very nice. Um, have to maintain flight logs for our deployments, right? So now then we're looking at this going, okay, this is getting to be more cumbersome than the benefit. Um, maintenance records, inspection records, pre and post flight records, right? Um, did you change a blade? Did you crash it into a tree recently? Right, on a deployment, right? What happened to the aircraft? How much did that cost? What did the incident report read? Was it accurate and factual? You know, what city manager say when he saw it, right? So all those types of things. And believe it or not, it's the craziest little things that just eat you up on this deal. But, so we developed an internal document um, for us so that anytime we go out and we deploy, it captures who, what, where, when, how long, the coordinates, the flight length, the number of flights that we made from that location, and did we contact the FAA, and then how did we do it? Did we contact pilots in the air over the radio? Did we call the ATC? You know, what? how did we do it? So we need a document filled out for every time we fly to match the database that's captured in the remote so that if we ever get inspected, we don't have any deployments that we don't have paper for. That was one of the requirements that city management wanted for us. The International Fire Service Training Association reached out to us. They knew that we were getting into this pretty heavily. And they said, hey, we want you to serve as our liaison on NFPA standard 2400. I said, what? And they said, yeah, we want you to serve on this committee. Uh, you're gonna fly all, we're gonna fly you all over, the, all over the United States. You're gonna go to all these meetings. You're gonna design and develop all these um, plans and processes and guidelines for everybody that's got drones in the fire world. What? It was one of the best things that ever happened to us. We got to meet and greet people from all over the United States that were using drones in their deployments, that were using drones to help their public safety officials. Um, and we really learned a lot about the program and how we could redevelop it for our, for our community. So we still sit on this committee. Um, the um, second rendition of, of changes has been made to this and, and it will be released soon. All right, let's talk about deployments because I don't have just a whole lot more time. These are not in any particular order, but when we first started, I told you we bought these for fire responses, right? We wanted to be able to put this aircraft up in the air, look around, tell us where the fire was, the direction of the fire, were there any units close to it, were there, were there any structures close to it, were we going to lose anything? So <clears throat> when we found out that we had extreme limitations, we started looking back and and thinking about ways that we could support other departments. So here we go. So development services, right? And I'll show you some of that. So big projects that we have done, they want before and after pictures. So when they go to city council, they can show city council um, what we've done, right? Or what they've done. Code enforcement. Um, you've got a, got a property owner that is pretty aggressive towards code enforcement officers. Guess what? Doesn't matter anymore. We just go out, we fly, we fly the property, we take the pictures, we upload them to the network drive, code enforcement takes them and takes action on the, on the property owner. Damage assessment surveys. Um, I am very pleased to say that we have not done tornado assessment for our own community. Hold on just a second. We have done ice storms, we have done floods, but not tornadoes yet. But we have gone to other communities where we've deployed for that. Fire, um, we've had some large structural fires and on um, our latest aircraft, our Matrice 300, we have a FLIR camera uh, that is very, very good at, at being able to tell us the external temperatures 
so that we can see where the most intense portion of the fire is inside of a structure. Industrial fires, so that we can fly the roof line, never have to put a ladder on the side of the building unless it's absolutely necessary. Wildland fire surveys, so this is after it's come through. We go fly it, we get the, the acreage, we fill it out, we, we fill out the form for the fire department, we send it to the state, we send it to the fire department. If an F, F mag is available later, we have all that documentation so that we can get that fire, um, fire grant later. Uh, law enforcement. This is kind of new. Um, in 2015, we had a very, very bad accident at one of our special events, and we did accident reconstruction. Um, as you can imagine, that was a pretty chaotic scene, and it was very important that we documented everything. That was the first time that we had ever deployed um, an SUAS on an incident where we flew at four foot, six foot, 10 foot, and 100 foot to be able to capture all the different levels of approaches to the intersection. Search and rescues, we've done, I can't tell you how many missing children, um, how many uh, silver alerts. Um, overwatch for our SWAT team members. If they're in the field, we've got an aircraft airborne and there's a SWAT commander standing at the back of my unit watching exactly what that aircraft sees so we can see his people in real time. Surveillance, we've gone out and do, done surveillance um, with the aircraft um, for uh, law enforcement prior to um, a search warrant or an arrest warrant or both being issued. Um, and then reconnaissance. We've done some reconnaissance on some structures 30 minutes before they're gonna go out and serve a search warrant. So fly it. Google will only tell you so much. The image is only so good. We have access to pictometry, but it's only so good as the day that the picture was taken and things change. People move in, people move out. And man, I tell you, there's all kinds of pitfalls. So we go out and with this zoom lens that we have, we can be 400 foot in the air. You never hear the aircraft, you never see it. And we can take pictures of license plates and when they expire and VIN numbers. I mean, it's, it's, it's that good, right? So we go out and do a little reconnaissance. Missing persons, um, children and adult, we've been involved in that several different times, even several different counties around us and then special events so we do have restrictions on being able to fly over crowds of people we cannot directly fly over crowds of people we can fly perimeter edges and we can fly over first responders but we can't fly over an individual civilian um, at a special event but what we can do is we can put up in the air we can look at the crowd and we can see what the general mood is of the crowd, right? We've had some civil unrest issues that have come up and we wanted to know, are they peaceful? Are they, are they, just, are they just marching? Are they just talking? Are they just, what are they doing, right? So, so we put up and we put up in a, in a little bit farther away area, kind of zoom in and just get a general idea of what the crowd's doing. And it has paid dividends for us in, in how we respond and how we posture and how we let the community know that we're responding to what's going on. All right, so this is a development services flight. So I've got these choked down and these are gonna repeat if I talk longer than what they are. But if you look at this image, you can see all the fresh concrete that's in this intersection. So I didn't do the, the before and after because it wasn't necessarily pertinent to this talk, but development services asked us to go out and they asked us to fly this where they had completed this project. They wanted to see the traffic moving, they wanted to see the lights in operation, they wanted to see people sitting or driving on their project because this was a very large project that took quite some time to complete in our community. So this is a prime example of what we um, do for development services. Code enforcement, this is not a video, this is a static image, but these two houses we wanted to condemn and we wanted them removed from the property. This was a five-year process. Once we got the aircraft involved and started taking pictures of the progress, what happened was it really ramped it up where the individual actually ended up paying to have those um, homes removed off the property and then vacated it so it was no longer um, um, going against code. Emergency rescues, in 2019 we had pretty significant flooding um, in Oklahoma where um, we had a 500 year event over a 30 
30 day period. And I can't zoom in on this, but there is a, a lady on a stretcher um, that is going in and to an ambulance to the hospital. And there goes our fire department and the rescue boat to go collect some more people from homes that have flooded that when we went to them and asked them to leave because it was going to flood, they said, no, we're going to stay. When the water started coming in the house, now we're making rescues. So just a, just an overwatch. Okay, same, same concept, only this time somebody reports that a car is in the water. Well, instead of sending a boat out, we can launch the aircraft very quickly, sit down, and, and it's not a complete video, but we can sit down and look right in the window and see if there's anybody in the vehicle because we can circle completely around the vehicle. I can even land on it if I wanted to, but I can look right in the windows and see, is it necessary to send people out to that vehicle? Is this a rescue? Is this a recovery? And then we can update that information while the, while the crews are still getting ready. All right, here's fires. This is a relatively calm day. This was sparked by a welder building fence, um, got off into some trees. There was some concern from the battalion chief that they wanted to make sure that while the crews were off the trucks, that's the most dangerous time for firefighters is when they get off the trucks into the field, right? They wanted to see, they wanted to know what was going on. So what we do is we fly up, we find them. Our firefighters wear all yellow wildland gear so that they can be easily spotted. You can see them um, as, they, as they walk around. It actually looks really good from right here, I'm just gonna tell you, but I know it's a little far away and we didn't zoom in. That was actually done with the, that white aircraft there. We had a missing persons. We had um, an elderly gentleman that was probably 75, 78 years old, had dementia really bad, got in his truck, drove away. A farmer found him. It was very muddy. We couldn't get resources down to him. The one person that is there had walked in while we were en route from Stillwater to this location. We deployed over a mile away and flew up there to verify that there was somebody there with the vehicle. And then we actually sat down, read the license plate and confirmed that they were there. This is the arrest of a hominy um, murder suspect. Um, turns out that this guy had hatcheted somebody up, had a buddy helping um, roll him up in a, in a um, uh, carpet and OSBI contacted us this night. It's minus 10 degrees the night that this happens. We're pushing the thresholds of what the aircraft can do, but the officers pull up in the unit and he's thinking it's his ride. They get out, rifles drawn. You can see the guy at the end of the building right here. And they subsequently arrest him, take him into custody with no incident. What's funny is uh, we're at about 250 feet. It is extremely cold, so you can see their footprints on the ground. Um, it's that cold. But you can actually see him throw the hatchet because he was planning on killing his friend that he had contacted to come pick him up because it was his only witness. This is in Cushing, Oklahoma. What you're looking at is, this is a suspect house, this is our MRAP, and these are all of our TAC members right here, staged and poised and ready to go in. They, they launched gas into the house and everything, and then we ended up taking the, the person in the house into custody. But these are the types of overwatch that we provide to the supervisor. Special events, I think this is my last one. Special events, so um, in Stillwater, we have Oklahoma State University, obviously, and sometimes um, we have to change up our traffic plans to be able to get 70,000 worth of people out of the stadium and out of town or back to their homes, and we will contraflow roads so that all roads go one direction and, and no more two-lane traffic. So one of the things that we do is we will fly this and we will watch the traffic to see if our plans actually meet what the expectation is. Okay, the top one is this one here. The middle one, or this one right here, is the one that we just, the platform we just left. That's an Inspire Pro 2 series. Um, believe it or not, we, we've flown that aircraft more than we've flown anything. And then, so I think we, 15,000, I think it was 
close to 20000 for everything that we got with this, all the peripherals, right? Battery chargers, gang chargers, things that keep us in the air constantly. And then we went to the Matrice 300. That's not exactly the one that we have sitting here. It's just a web image. But believe it or not, city approved $36,000 for us to buy that aircraft and all the peripherals that go with it because we started out with this, showed what it would do, and then here we are to this. Now, this one is about a 15 to 18 minute flight time on brand new batteries. As they, as they get older, 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes. This one, 45 to 50 minute flight time because it's carrying two batteries. We put it up, we just let it sit and hover in most instances. Um, thermal, we have um, a 40 by optical zoom and then a 10 optical zoom on that. Um, FLIR, we can do picture in picture or side by side with the FLIR and with the 4K camera. Um, we have the spotlight on it where we can sync um, the, um, the camera and the, and the light so that no matter where one goes, the other goes. And then on top of that, we have a <clears throat> top gimbal that we can put a um, speaker on top of and make announcements if we had to to crowds. It is not exactly what we thought we were getting when we got that speaker, but it does work and it is effective and you can hear it from about 300 feet very clearly. It will make people go. A couple things, really, really quick. You have to register your aircraft. You have to stay current on your part 107. There are always changes. There are exemptions for government that you can register for where you can fly in no fly zones. You have to basically sign your life away and say that you understand what you're doing, but you can do it. The testing, the training. We recommend that you have several people that can deploy. Don't rely on one person to be a pilot, right? So we had five started the process, three that passed, two that did, didn't really want to fly because of the magnitude of the equipment. And I'm telling you, last week I flew that thing right into a tree at 4.30 in the morning and a lot of people, I mean, myself included, thought, well, how am I going to explain that? We got lucky, just busted a set of props, aircraft was good. Um, you need multiple people, okay? Um, be prepared to be called more and more once people understand what you can do with the aircraft. Um, start small, become proficient, get good. Don't just jump off in the deep end of the pool and try to catch up, right? Start small and get good. If you have a team that's assigned to the air operations, perfect, right? But if you're flying and you got somebody flying, you're not doing something else that needs to be done, right? So we'll be sitting working very diligently in our office, get a phone call, hey, we need you to go fly the drone this afternoon. And it takes away from our job that we have to get up and go do this for them because it's usually a time crunch because we didn't think that we were gonna tell emergency management that we, in a couple of weeks we're gonna need this. Train regularly and build in training days. That's very critical, right? Um, we fly a lot, so we don't have a lot of training days that we use, but I will tell you the reason I crashed the other day is we have a pre-flight inspection. And we got in a hurry trying to find a suspect and I did not complete the pre-flight inspection. But when we did a firmware update, it put the remote control controls back to default. I'm a left-handed flyer. My left is up, my right is forward. It put it backwards. I was only coming up just a little bit as I slung shot that aircraft into the tree. If I had completed my pre-flight, never would have happened. So you have to be very proficient and you have to always do the safety parts of the aircraft. Um, that's it. <clears throat> I know you guys have lots of questions. I do want to add one more thing. Um, in addition to the aircraft that we have here on the table, and, and we still fly this one, uh, the little one, for, for practice and stuff because it still flies the same way as the big one, but it's got training wheels on it we are transitioning to where we may start to fly more indoors instead of sending officers in a house somewhere, we may fly more indoors as much as we do outdoors. The other thing, we have purchased a drone detection system or drone radar. 
We spent $13,000 on this device. It requires a cellular connection or Wi-Fi connection. We deploy it at all the home football games, and if I hadn't have been in such a hurry today, I'd have brought it to show you what it looks like, how little it is. Um, but it's basically about the size of that case right there. Open it up, it's got a monitor on it, you put some antennas on it. If an aircraft launches, um, I think our coverage range is about 10 miles for the stadium. If an aircraft launches, we can see where the pilot is piloting the aircraft from and we can see where the aircraft is at and it tracks all of it. It captures their tail number when they lifted off, when they went on radar, their flight patterns and everything. And we have now implemented plans that when an aircraft approaches, so I don't know if you guys know, but over every large venue where large groups of people can be, there is a no-fly zone 24 hours in advance. And what happens is if they take off and they start coming towards the stadium, we contact law enforcement and have an officer go by to the pilot, contact the pilot and have them recall the aircraft. If they don't recall the aircraft, we have more extreme measures to take an aircraft out of the sky before it gets within what they call the outside edge of the bowl, right? Where there's a captive audience of 70,000 people. So um, we have that as well as the aircraft, we have the detection system that we um, can deploy for special events and we do just to make sure that we're not future targets. So with that, any questions? It is. So we ride the fence. We fly with a purpose because we have to have the paperwork, but also at the same time, we're not somewhere um, taking pictures of something that we couldn't ordinarily take a picture of anyway. We're not targeting somebody necessarily. We're just taking very broad pictures that show from the air properties. Absolutely. That is, that is correct. So we are. We get an overview first, and then if they need to, they'll go into the backyard and take the pictures. Mm -hmm. We do the same. We also look at insulators when we're flying some bad insulators and every once in a while you'll get, um, I can't remember what the wire is in the phasing, but there'll be a wire and if it is not there, you know that you've, that's the, one of your sources of your problems. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. So we actually flew um, in the city of Cushing, which is a community um, that's in Payne County with us. We actually flew to look at a rust spot in their paint and zoomed way in to get an image of that to see if it was cancerous, if it was superficial, if they needed to do something with it, or if they had some time. And it turns out it had, they had some time. And then we went to another small community at, at Drumright that was just a little bit farther east of there. They had a large water leak and they couldn't find it. So we popped up in the air and got an aerial view. And after you look at the ground and the terrain and the way it was laid out, you could see where it was the wettest. And they, we, we took them from a six block leak to a concentrated half block. So they only had to dig up a half block worth of dirt on a, on a pipeline to be able to find, or a water line to be able to find the leak itself. So we save them a lot of time and money. Yes, yes, good. Sir. So one of the things that um, my city manager is very um, pro on is that we, we have the abilities to purchase these and we're gonna share the services with other people. Yeah, we don't try to bill for anything like that. It's a, it's a, 
a mutual aid, if you will. It's a, just a community favor to somebody. And we don't. We just go. We have the means, and he said that we were going to share those means with other people. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.